Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Mazel Tov again to the Ungers and the Milgrams. So glad we could celebrate together today. Shabbat is supposed to be altogether joyful. Even in Kitavo, this week's Parsha, which lists a series of blessings if we follow God's commandments and curses if we don't, we read that the curses will come Tachat asher lo avadata et Hashem elokecha besimcha uvetuv levav merov kol. Because you did not serve your God in joy and gladness over the abundance of everything. At the core of this parsha, this chapter of Torah, is the idea that what God is truly after is our joy. God wants us to feel a sense of abundance. Simcha uvetuv levav merov kol. Gladness over the abundance of everything. Which may be why the first thing we're supposed to do when we enter the promised land is gather up our first fruits, put them in a basket and bring them to the Kohen, the priest, and declare outright how blessed we are. Look how far we've come. Look at everything we have. And yet, Sometimes we feel a sense of scarcity or spiritual famine that makes it a lot harder to access that place of abundance. We're missing Rabbi Hal this week. And while we should all be comforted in knowing that he's okay and all is well, how can we be truly joyful this Shabbat when we're without him? And whomever else you're carrying in your heart today for a full and speedy recovery, or whatever other hardship you're bringing with you into Shabbat this week, do we have any right to rejoice this Shabbos when what we actually feel is sad? To focus on light and blessing when what we actually feel is darkness and curse? It's a question we're constantly faced with. So let's take it to the extreme. If you happened to watch Saturday Night Live following the unspeakable sorrow of September 11th, which we'll commemorate in just over a week now, Paul Simon sang his classic song, The Boxer. And it was clear that America, bruised and broken in that moment, was the boxer he was singing about. In the clearing stands a boxer and a fighter by his trade. And he carries the reminders of every glove that laid him down or cut him till he cried out in his anger and his shame, I am leaving, I am leaving, but the fighter still remains. Hopeful in the end that America would sustain the blows and remain on its feet. That was an iconic moment, but here's what happens next. After the song, Lauren Michaels, the producer of the show, asks then mayor of New York City, Rudy Giuliani, a sensitive question. Can we be funny? Giuliani considers that and says, why start now? <laughs> that gave America permission to laugh again when all it wanted to do was cry, because laughter is such an important part of the healing process. And so here comes Shabbat, with its nagging insistence that we find joy. And here comes Ki Tavo, with its very first verse that commands us to gather up our blessings, put them in a basket, and serve God with joy, even if not naturally inclined to joy in that moment. Why? Because that's the essence of life itself. Rabbi Nachman of Bretzlav, who was no stranger to sadness, the great late 18th century Hasidic rabbi, tells this story. Sometimes when people are happy and dancing, they grab someone standing outside the circle who is depressed and melancholy. Against their will, they bring them into the circle of dancers and force them to be happy along with them. When a person is happy, gloom and suffering stand aside. This is the concept from the prophet Isaiah. They will attain gladness and joy as sadness and sighing flee. For at a time of joy, it is the nature of sadness and sighing to stand aside. Yet, one actually has to pursue them and to catch up and reach them in order to specifically introduce them into the joy. In other words, it doesn't seem like it's enough to keep joy and sorrow separate to experience just one and not the other. Sydney and Ben, we're celebrating your ofrif today in honor of your wedding this Sunday, tomorrow. 
The day you become a married couple is among the most supreme unbridled joys you'll ever experience. And what are you going to do under the chuppah in front of all your friends and family? You're going to break something. You're going to break a glass to remind us of the destruction of our temple. Because joy is generous. Joy isn't content to monopolize the day. It wants to reach out to sorrow and say, come dance with me. Let me hold you. I want even you to know what happiness tastes like. And that moment tastes like a Hillel sandwich. The ancient sage, Rabbi Hillel, isn't content with a haroset sandwich because haroset is only sweet. It's a Passover dish made from the fruits you might actually have found in that basket of bikurim, of first fruits. So what he does is he combines it with maror, the bitter herb that reminds us of slavery in Egypt, and unites them between pieces of matzah because that's really what life tastes like, bittersweet. It's rarely ever just one or the other. But then what do we make of this week's Torah reading where it really does seem like we get a clear dichotomy? Blessing here, curse there. God instructs us when we cross the Jordan into Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, to isolate two mountains. One is called Gerizim and the other is called Eval. And we're told to place the blessing on Mount Gerizim, meaning six representatives out of the 12 tribes stand on Mount Gerizim and describe all the ways we'll be blessed as a people if we honor our Jewish covenant. Meanwhile, representatives of the six remaining tribes ascend Mount Eval and pronounce the curse. Here's how we'll be punished if we choose to violate the covenant. There's no question that bitter and sweet remain separate here, except isn't it interesting that when you're standing on the peak of one mountain, you get a really good view of the other one? Maybe that's by design. Maybe God is trying to tell us something here. The aim of life can't be to hope for all blessing and no curse, or all joy and no sorrow. That's not life. It has to be about how we introduce one into the other. It's also all relative. Because the Hillel sandwich, where, we took, where he took joy and added sorrow, well, even with the horseradish, it's still more joyful than uh, two weeks from now when we'll eat nothing. <laughs> when we're down, how do we open the door and let joy in? And when we're dancing for joy, how do we reach out to sorrow and invite it in, elevate it? Because guess which mountain God tells us to build an altar on? You'd think it would be Mount Gerizim which is the mountain of blessing. It's not. We read, There, referring to Mount Eval, the curse mountain, you shall build an altar to your God and you shall sacrifice their offerings of well-being and eat them rejoicing before your God. We're told to rejoice on the mountain set aside for curse. Rashi, the medieval commentator, makes this exact point. He writes, in order to pacify the tribes that had been ordered to stand on Mount Eval while listening to the curses, Moses ordered the building of an altar of stones to be built there on which burnt offerings were to be offered. Also, peace offerings were to be offered there which are offerings that were eaten by the people at large, not just the priests and their households. This would convince the tribes lined up there that God's presence was as much in evidence there as above the tabernacle itself. God models the exact behavior Rav Nachman of Bretzlav describes in his story about the dancers. God comforts the six tribes on the mountain set aside for curse by commanding an altar be built there where they would bring offerings and rejoice, reaching out to sorrow and telling it to dance. Not banishing sorrow, but saying, hey, God can be found here too, even in this difficult moment. Life is never just one or the other. It's a bittersweet Hillel sandwich. So how do we embrace both? When in the throes of one, can we open ourselves up to the possibility 
of the other? I want to offer one more way to look at this ceremony. Because the Israelites are getting the rare opportunity to start again in the promised land. We're in Deuteronomy, and yet something here smacks of Genesis. God points to two natural organisms, not trees this time, but mountains, and says, blessing and life come from this one, while curse and death comes from that one. And God really doesn't want us to make the same mistake we made last time, so the first thing we're supposed to do, God says, give me all the fruit. It doesn't just smack of Genesis. It's also reminiscent of Psalm 121, which is a psalm of healing we recite every day here in our minion. Shir lamalot esa enai el heharim me'ain yavou ezri ezri me'im adonai ose shamaim v'aretz. I lift my eyes toward the mountains. Where will my help come? My help is from God, maker of heaven and earth. We look to the two mountains, and we're given a choice. That's the only dichotomy that remains after our discussion. Choice. We have no control over the fact that life will grace us with blessings and challenge us with curses. We'll inevitably experience the mountainous peaks and valleys of joy and sorrow. But what we do get to choose is what ultimately gets to define us. No matter how much maror, bitterness, is thrown onto our plate, we can always choose tihye bracha, to make our lives a blessing, to carry on the Jewish covenant and be a blessing. That's the only thing that has a clear yes or no, one or the other. We've been expelled from the Garden of Eden. We can't keep good and bad separate anymore. But the truth is, they never were. They always grew from the same tree. The question is, will we put our fruits in a basket and rejoice before God? We can't always control what happens in life, but we can always choose to make our lives a blessing. Shabbat Shalom.